Welcome students to the second lecture of nuclear astrophysics. I hope you got some idea about the framework of this course which I have discussed in the last lecture. Let me take a quick tour of the content which I have covered in the last lecture. So, the subject nuclear astrophysics a union of nuclear physics and astrophysics tries to explain how elements are synthesized in universe based on the knowledge of nuclear reactions and the energy produced from stars at a different stages. What is the role of nuclear physics to answer this question? So, these two are the important goals of nuclear astrophysics and I have listed a few questions, then I have provided some historical background which goes like following the observation of relatively high mass of a nucleus when compared to the sum of the constituent nucleons, I mean it is other way around the sum of the masses of the constituent nucleons is bit higher than the mass of the nucleus because of the change in the difference which is called as binding energy that has motivated people to think that if at all energy can be released from a nucleus, maybe energy from the sun is because of the nuclear reaction and the fusion of hydrogen into helium and whatever energy is released that could be the source of energy from the sun that was the proposal. But the major challenge was do you remember? The energy available was not sufficient to initiate a nuclear reaction because it is much lesser than the Coulomb barrier, the energy required for crossing the barrier when two nuclei having charges are present in the nuclear reaction. I am not talking about the neutrons as one of the entities where there is no point of any Coulomb barrier, but it was a gamma who proposed that even though the energy available is less than the Coulomb barrier based on quantum mechanical phenomenon that is tunneling process, yes nuclear reaction can indeed take place. But for that it is very important to have large amount of the matter and that led to the statement that there is a huge amount of hydrogen and helium in the sun. Of course, majority of it is, is hydrogen. Then I have given some brief information about the observational astronomy which we categorized into optical astronomy, radio astronomy and space astronomy. And the biggest advantage of space astronomy is that it will get rid of all the problems because of the weather and atmosphere and it is atmosphere which absorbs the large part of the electromagnetic spectrum coming from the stars. So, how can we lose it? So, that problem can be circumvented by using the instruments and telescopes by placing in the maybe balloons, sometimes in rockets and satellites and in the space laboratories and the future developments are based on neutrinos and gravitational waves. And while discussing the observational structure in the cosmos, I have given a few numbers regarding the properties of the sun. What is the mass of the sun, density, luminosity, surface temperature, all those things I have discussed. And then sun is a star and then I have I went for collection of stars. There we have seen the luminosity of the stars ranges from minus 4 to 6, 10 to the power of minus 4 to 6, whereas the mass ranges from 0 0.1 to 100. Why? There is a huge change in the luminosity when there is a small change in the mass that we have to understand in due course. And then I have introduced a term metallicity that means metals. In astronomy this word is used referring to presence of elements starting from carbon and we have categorized the stars into population 1 and population 2 stars. Population 1 stars they are young in terms of age and they have high metallic content and sun is part of population 1 star and old stars and having less metallic content comes under population 2 
stars. And frequently we are going to use this terminology population 1 and population 2. So, up to this I have discussed in the previous lecture. So, before entering into the actual nuclear aspect of the astrophysics, I am trying to provide this background where I am trying to give you the astronomy that is observe, observed features of universe which I have been discussing and I will take some more time in today's lecture. Then physics part, astrophysics that is explaining the universe, okay? observational part of the universe that is astronomy and explaining the observational features that is astrophysics. These two are the things I am uh, spending some time on in these two or three lectures. Let us continue today's lecture with the metallicity of stars. All right. So, metallicity that is one way to characterize the stars chemical composition is fraction by mass, hydrogen content if it is A and helium content B and if you go for C, everything other than hydrogen content, these two compress about 98 to 99 percent. Sometimes people say it is more than 99 percent. Okay? And another way is to characterize the star's chemical composition, iron to hydrogen. Why iron? This is most stable element which is evident from the binding energy curve. So, taking it as a reference, iron to hydrogen ratio, if we see for sun, because as I discussed in the last class, this symbol, it could be for mass, it could be for luminosity. So, this is helping us as a reference, right? And the logarithmic value of the ratio of iron to hydrogen is minus 4.33. That means, one iron atom for every 20,000 hydrogen atoms. So, there are two ways to characterize the chemical composition of stars and second way is iron to hydrogen ratio. The first way is the traditional way that is hydrogen content, helium content and everything else. And for star, we measure the metallicity, the, the chemical composition relative to the sun. So, iron to hydrogen ratio logarithmic value of the ratio of iron to hydrogen ratio for star, iron to hydrogen ratio for sun. So, this is how one can measure the chemical composition relative to sun. So, with this kind of definition of course, the metallicity of the sun is 0 with this kind of definition. Okay? So, it is important how the definitions are being used in different contexts. Fine? Let us continue. The range of the star's metallicity. So, with this kind of definition, if we see the iron to hydrogen ratio, the metallicity ranges from minus 4.5 to 1. So, whenever I quote this kind of ranges, I want you to remember the other numbers also L by L naught 10 to the power of minus 4 to 10 to the power of 6. Mass about 0 0.1 to 100, though most of the stars, they are either comparable to mass of the sun or equal to mass of the sun, most of the stars. And above this, they are very rare and above 100, the stars have not been identified, which I have discussed in the previous lecture. And this is a reference from which this information is taken. And as I said, population 1 and population 2 stars like this we can categorize. In terms of metallicity, some numbers, earlier I have given you some qualitative number. Now, let me provide some quantitative information, population 1 and population 2 stars. So, the stars which are having iron to hydrogen ratio greater than minus 1, they come under population 1 and less than minus 1 come under population 2. So, the while modeling the formation of galaxies and the evolution of galaxies which is a collection of stars, they have to explain why there are different population of stars in different parts of the galaxy. When we try to model the universe which is a collection of star galaxies and galaxy is a collection of stars. So, it is important to include the this aspect of metallicity while modeling the galaxy formation. Okay? And what is the relation between 
the metallicity of the star and the color of the star which is directly uh, linked with the temperature of the star okay so it is very well known that stars with less metal appears blue and stars appearing with blue they are very very hot whereas the stars which appears red they are considered cool why this we have to answer slowly so please think about this question why i mean in this slide i have tried to correlate the color of the star what about the color of the sun it is yellowish right so sun is yellow star whereas stars hotter than sun they appear in blue stars cooler than sun there they appear in red why is there any relation between the color of the star and the metallicity and the metallicity in this context i am using the definition iron to hydrogen ratio fine so this question you have to remember and try to answer based on the information given in due course all right so stars when we discuss in general stars are binary in nature under the influence of gravitational force the stars are bound to each other and of course they will rotate okay and the pairs pairs of star pair of stars bound by their mutual gravitational attraction we call them as binary stars and some of the photographs have shown i mean some photographs you can see in this slide and other than binary stars you can also come across clusters of stars and which suggests a common origin in the condensation and fragmentation of a large cosmic cloud so this is a clusters of stars there are many types of stars that uh, whose categories we will discuss in the next slides okay like unusual stars when we say unusual in what sense we are using this word see stars they live for millions and billions of years stars live for millions and billions of years by producing energy constantly throughout their life and they will die in different ways but there are a few stars which de deviate from this kind of procedure those comes under those stars are com, uh, can be categorized into unusual stars okay so they provide better understanding of the nature and evolution of stars which can be categorized into following types eclipsing stars which are known for the periodic change in brightness eruptive stars the change in the brightness is not periodic but quite irregular like supernova which is the last stage of the star after explosion when it happens and then pulsating stars they contract and expanding expand alternately so as the word suggests literally they are pulsating stars in the sense of expansion contraction alternately so after discussing about the sun that means solar system and then the stars let me go into the interstellar space so with this information you can see it is not empty the space between the two stars is not always empty earlier please recollect one statement i have given the nearest star when we take the sun is about 4 light years away right but this space between stars is not many times empty you will see it is filled with something to its certain extent okay so it is not empty for example if you take the sun vicinity 3 to 5% of the gas is accompanied by a small dust okay and you can also see many photographs uh, related to stars and galaxy you will see few clouds between the stars they are quite luminous they are luminous because of the light coming from the stars and falling on this dust okay so the, whenever you assume you come across a luminous clouds that luminosity is because of the falling of the light from the star nearby it okay and this can the interstellar space mainly these clouds 
they can be studied by radio and ir astronomy infrared astronomy now after discussing solar system and stars and interstellar space let me go to the next higher level that is galaxy so galaxy contains millions and billions of stars fine so let us start with the galaxy in which we reside that is milky way galaxy it has been named as milky way galaxy unlike people think sun is not at the center of the milky way galaxy okay it is away from the center fine and some numbers are given here solar system 287 billion kilometers and earth 13000 kilometers and the diameter of milky way galaxy is expected to be 1 lakh light years 1 lakh light years now you can always ask where from these values are coming from is it really some kind of prediction no the studies of the stars and collection of stars and galaxies using observational astronomy based on the facilities available on earth and space like hubble telescope when studies have been made with all the parts of the galaxy and all the parts of the universe these numbers came out fine so a galaxy our galaxy consists of billions of stars i have said and glowing gas and dark clouds there is present inside the galaxy and if you see the collection of the stars in this galaxy it is like a flat disk right and what are the properties of this galaxy some numbers have let me try to give in terms of shape it is a spiral and around 100 billion stars are there in the milky way galaxy literally people have counted the number of stars it's about 100 billion stars in our milky way galaxy and the central region is a spheroidal concentration of stars like 10000 light years or more in diameter the central central region i'm talking about whereas the whole diameter of the milky way galaxy is about 1 lakh light years and evidence is growing regarding the existence of black hole at the center of the galaxy now even nobel prize also given for the existence of black hole fine though i am not going into the details of it though you might be interested to know more because you are suggested to go through the books on astronomy so this course is all about the role of nuclear physics in understanding the properties of the stars synthesis of elements and energy produced in the stars which make the universe all right and what is the mass of our galaxy it's about 10 to the power of 12 times the mass of the sun and only 10% accounts for detectable stars gas and dust what about remain 90% that is the mystery that is missing mass what i am trying trying to convey is that when you detect and measure the stars and the interstellar space which is consisting of gas and the dust it amounts to be 10% of the mass which was estimated using other methods so not only one method is available to find out the mass of the galaxy so one traditional method is that physically what you see in the galaxy that is the stars and interstellar space there are some clouds and gas and some dust you measure the mass of them i mean you measure their mass some of their masses should be equal to the mass of the galaxy but it is not the case only 10% of the mass of the galaxy is coming from the masses of physically seen entities what about remaining 90% this is a missing mass and we have no clue about it to a reasonable level this is quite interesting isn't it now after discussing the properties of the sun which is the basis of the solar system and then collection of stars and then galaxy which is the collection of stars mainly and then coming to the collection of galaxies that is universe so like a galaxy contains billions of stars universe contains billions of galaxies so i am sure the numbers which i am going to provide in this slide will be quite interesting for you so some 
image based on logarithmic maps of the universe put together by the researchers from Princeton University and also images produced by NASA based on observations made by the telescope and roving spacecraft. So, is not it very beautiful the universe picture? It has been proved that the number of galaxies is about tens of billions in the galaxy, I mean in the universe okay? and the total number of the stars in the universe is about 10 to the power of 22. So, using observational techniques people have counted the number of stars in the universe, it is about 10 to the power of 22 all right? and what is the mass of the universe? 10 to the power of 22 times mass of the sun. What about the mass of the Milky Way galaxy? It was about 10 to the power of 12 times mass of the sun and if you go to collection of galaxies that is universe, the mass of the universe is about 10 to the power of 22 times the mass of the sun. The interesting thing is that though we say the mass is 10 to the power of 22 times the mass of the sun, the space between the stars and galaxies is so huge that when we see the physical universe, it looks like almost empty. Like most of the atom is empty, like most of the universe is empty. What a beautiful correlation, is not it? Inside the atom you have, you know the size of the nucleus, less than 0.1 percent of the size of the atom and around the nucleus when we say electrons are orbiting around the nucleus and most of the atom is empty. Similarly, the universe though the mass is 10 to the power of 22 times mass of the sun, most of the space is empty. So, let me give you some numbers. Okay? If we consider, if we assume stars as raindrops, how many stars are there in the universe? As per the data available, 10 to the power of 22 stars are available. And if you assume stars as raindrops, the separation between these raindrops is about 100 kilometers. Now, can you imagine a separation of 100 kilometers between two raindrops when you see the rain? No. If that is the case, you see there is no rain at all, if there is a 100 kilometer distance between two raindrops, is not it? So, the stars and galaxies, they occupy 10 to the power of minus 25 in the universe. So, whatever is space available in the universe, only 10 to the power of minus 25 is occupied by the galaxies. So, the density if you see, it is about 10 to the power of minus 31 grams per centimeter cube. So, universe is a classic example of ultra high vacuum. What is the unit of vacuum? Nothing but pressure, right? Tor. Maybe in some experiments you have seen the values of the vacuum. You try to create the vacuum using some pumps, for example. Using rotary pump, you can achieve 10 to the power of minus 2 to 10 to the power of minus 3 tor. Then if you go to diffusion pump, you can achieve 10 to the power of minus 6 tor. Then you go for ion pump, molecular pump, cryo pump, then you can go for maximum 10 to the power of minus 12 kind of thing. The classic case of ultra high vacuum, where it is? We are inside the universe. So, I am sure you have enjoyed these numbers related to the universe, related to the universe. So, what we have understood from this? From the sun and from the data of stars, and then about the galaxy and then universe. We have seen the numbers of the stars and then masses, their luminosities and various other features when we discuss observational structures in the cosmos. Where is nuclear physics inside it? Till now, I have not touched on the nuclear part which is basically the essence of our course nuclear astrophysics. But this background is important to understand the role of nuclear physics in stars. Let me start other topic after discussing the salient features of universe, galaxy and the solar system. Yes, we have seen some numbers regarding the galaxies, number of stars and the density, available space, 
distance between the galaxies and ultimately ultra, ultra high vacuum of the universe. There are a few beautiful and interesting properties of the universe, which I am calling them as selected general properties of the universe, selected general properties of the universe. When I say selected general properties, how these properties have been analyzed, where from we got the information about these properties of the universe. See, whatever objects are there within the universe, you do some kind of measurements based on the observations from the measurements, you compare the properties in terms of space, time and magnitude. The evolution of universe became plausible only based on the observation of objects within the universe and comparison of the properties of these properties, comparison of the properties of these objects in terms of mass, in terms of space, time and the magnitude. Then once you compare the properties of these objects in these terms, that gives you information about the properties of the universe because the universe is composed of these objects. So, that is the thing which I am trying to convey in this slide. Okay? What are the selected properties made here? Elemental abundances, referral of elemental abundances as universal abundances. So many elements are in our surroundings. How those elements are formed? What are the nuclear reactions responsible for formation of those elements? And if we see the abundance of those elements, you know, not all elements, of course, you know very well that not all elements have equal abundance on earth. Not only in earth, inside the stars also, the abundance of elements is not uniform. But does it possess any kind of trend when we see the elemental abundance curve? We will discuss more. So, that has been obtained only after the comparison of properties of the objects based on many measurements. Okay? And if you see the mass of the stars and the luminosity of the star, is there any relationship or not? So, by doing many measurements, lot of observations on all parts of the galaxy, that means all stars inside one galaxy, when you measure the mass of each star and the luminosity of each star, then when you plot mass versus luminosity, can then be can there be a beautiful uh, or interesting feature outside uh, out of it? That is called as HR diagram. Okay, so this is another important selected property. So when you see the abundance of elements, that gives one important property of the universe. When you see the relation between mass and luminosity, that gives another property of the universe. And when you see the distance galaxies using telescopes, we get another property that is Hubble's law. Okay? So, Hubble's law is another important selected general property of the universe. And last but not the least, the observation of 2.76 Kelvin rem remnant of photons because of the cosmic background radiation. So, this is something called like a capstone for the hypothesis of Big Bang. So, in the next lecture, I am going to discuss each and every property I have mentioned here. What are those properties? Elemental abundance curve, HR diagram, Hubble's law and 2.7 Kelvin remnant, photon remnant, which is the, which has given a thorough proof for the Big Bang hypothesis and age of the universe. Of course, beyond this, there are some more like quasars and other things that we will not discuss. I hope you have enjoyed today's class. To summarize today's lecture, I have provided the metallicity of the stars, how population 1 and population 2 stars are separated from each other. Then I have discussed the properties of solar system, stars, galaxy and the universe and I have started discussing selected general properties of the universe. And the next lecture, these four selected general properties of the universe I will discuss in detail. Thank you very much for your attention.